Welcome to the Failure to Stop podcast channel, the number one channel where first responders go to be informed and entertained. This week's, uh, today's episode, last call of the day, that's the episode that gives you something else to talk about this weekend with your civilian friends, something other than dead babies and domestic violence. Speaking of domestic violence, it is Domestic Violence Awareness Week, so go check on your state troopers' wives and make sure they're doing okay. Oh, that was a joke at the state troopers. I'm just kidding. Listen, nobody knows domestic violence better than a street cop other than a state trooper, and that's just because usually they're the suspects. It's another bad state trooper joke. We love you guys. Seriously, keep your hands off uh, your loved ones. Please uh, be the example to follow. Today's show is brought to you by ghostbed.com forward slash wolfpack, officerprivacy.com forward slash wolfpack, and manscaped.com promo code Wolfpack. We've got a special guest today. It's Ken Shamrock. All this and more on today's last call of the day. Let's go. The growing calls across the nation to defund the police. To end policing as we know it. Off the charts violence in New York City. 11 people shot in just eight hours on Sunday. This is Sunday. about the police officers, officers who every single day put on that uniform and they run towards danger when we run away from it. Oh, guns up, giddy up. Welcome to Fire to Stop's last call. I got with me in the studio right now, Mr. Ken Shamrock. Can you smell what the Shamrock is cooking? No, that wasn't it. That wasn't it. Uh, Welcome to the show, brother. No, not that one either. All right, well, it's the world's deadliest man. How about that? Is that it? Now we're working. Now we're working with something. <laughs> oh, I know it's early. I know it's early, brother. Oh, I'm so pumped that you're on here, man. We're going to be down there for your Valor bare knuckle fight in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, how did you come about putting together Valor? Uh, I, I, me and uh, years and years of fighting that I had, you know, obviously successful and really enjoyed what I was doing. There was a... Uh, opportunity for me at the end of my career to stay involved because I even when I was older and I was fighting and I wasn't doing so well I still loved it I still just couldn't walk away from it and um, so I thought well if I'm going to stay involved I'm gonna stay involved with it through more of the outside of it like promoting fights and you know being able to have other guys follow their dreams and, and be able to watch them succeed and you know stay in, involved in it because there's no way at that age and all the the uh, injuries that I had taken that I could literally compete in the ring, but I didn't want to leave it. So I started promoting, I started building a a vision, but doing it, I didn't want to do it anything other than what I did when I was fighting. And that was doing it the best. So I had to come up with some thoughts and things that I experienced throughout my career with the media, with the fan base, with the fighters, being able to come up with a vision um, that would fit, something that would make it better listening to the individuals I just talked about. So some of the things I came up with was, you know, the no clinching. I just felt like, you know, especially me as a fighter, you're in there punching and a guy grabs you because you catch him with the shot. To me, that's like cheating. You should have to be able to have to fight your way out of that, not hug your way out of it. And watching Mike Tyson fight over the years, I saw a lot of that too, which ruined um, boxing. Because every time someone gets hurt, they hold you. And then if you got a power puncher, they throw three punches and then they grab you so the power guy can't get off. So it just felt like, let's take that out because it, it, it really encourages guys to have to fight. And that's what you're there for. The other thing was the gloves. I felt like it took away the purity of submissions. It took the purity of striking. Um, it took away the God-given talent, literally putting something on someone to make them better. I felt was not right along like, you know, kind of the same thing with the, with the clinching. It just, it just gave them a way to cheat, you know, to put something on and make them better. And so we took that off, uh, no tape, no gloves, you make it pure God given talent. And, and then, you know, the, um, the, I, I also believe that when you're getting in the ring there, there's a mentality, right. That you're there to fight. And so, One of the things I thought about when I was listening to the fans and the media and talking about how they couldn't get a good shot or they couldn't see because there was always something in the way, that being the ropes or the cage. And so I felt like we take that down. You know, when did you ever need, when you see two guys going at one another, that you need to have ropes and cages to 
to make them fight. And so I felt like let's just make that more of a visual experience for the fan base and for the media um, so that they're able to see the fights better. Because when you're in there fighting, that's what you're doing. And if you're not, then you don't belong there. So just coming up with some of these things and the thoughts of bringing in Valor, you know, after I got to the end of my career, I didn't want to leave it. I loved it. I thought like going into it, I wanted to figure if I can, how can I make it better? So tapping into my experiences as a fighter and, and then listening to the fan base and listening to the media and some of the things they were saying and then developing what now we have called as Valor, um, all of those experiences and ideas are put into there. But it came from my love of fighting. Well, you've been fighting for a long time. One of my favorite stories uh, that I, I heard about you or heard from you on another podcast was the story mm -hmm. about you getting kicked out of a, I guess it's a group home. Uh, you're like the fastest person to ever get kicked out of a, a group home before you went homeless. So you've been fighting on the streets from day one. Listen, I'm going to jump into all that because I think cops can relate it and they need to hear that story because you never know when you're going to run across a Ken Shamrock and uh, what your what, what that meeting can be like for that for that child's life. But uh, going back to your Valor Bare Knuckle fights, when this world folds into chaos, which is probably coming sooner than we'd like, I'd like to link up with you. I have a business idea. It's where cops and like gang members, they meet in a ring similar, but the cop gets no gun. And then the suspect gets all the same tools, the pepper spray, the baton, the handcuffs, and then the cop and the guy, they got to go at it. Uh, just mano y mano. It's just fared up. Suspect wins. He's free to go. Cop right. wins. He's got to go to jail and he's got to do the whole sentence, full long-term sentence. Think that would go over? Yeah, I like it. <laughs> right? I think it's fair. I like it. I think it's right. No plea deals or anything. I'd be like, look, okay, here's here's the deal. You can either go through the trials and the juries and everything, or you and this cop, both with the same tools, can meet in the in the ring. And then uh, if you win, then uh, you get to go free. But if the cop wins, you got to do the full sentence. There's no plea deal. And what I think is going to happen with this, I've really thought this through, obviously, is now the cops got to train. They got to get in shape. And, uh, and they got to pick and choose their battles wisely. They can't just go around, uh, you know, taking those soft, easy targets. Uh, I think it's a brilliant idea, I'm patenting it. Um, I'll join up to you. We'll do it 60-30. Yeah, I, like, I, I, think I'm, I, li I think I like the cops better. <laughs> <laughs> you ever train cops? I have, yes. Yeah. I did. I did that for a while. I trained prison guards. Um, I trained the military. So I've trained and very much involved in – uh, training a lot of our first responders and military uh, and very, uh, very supportive of that because I know the decisions that they have to make every single day are very tough. Um, and I also believe that, you know, a lot of people don't understand what it is to be have to physically be involved in an altercation and how how tough it is to make those decisions when you're in it, um, whether you should use force or not use force. Uh, it's a split second of life and death. I always say that the the, the best cop is the most well-trained and well-versed cop because, you know, listen, they got rid of the warrior mindset. That's something that after Ferguson or after uh, Michael Brown happened, they got rid of the warrior mindset training. Used to be in the academy and a lot of your accredited agencies, they had a week-long training called the warrior mindset. They gotten rid of that. They now call it protector mindset, which I think is different. I think it's noble that you call it protector, yada, yada, yada. But I think the protector takes away from the point. And the point is a warrior. And a real warrior, when, when a cop is at his best, when he's trained at his best, just you, you know, right, going into the mat, when, you're, when you know that you've put in that work and that effort, you're a different person. You make better decisions. You're actually a friendlier cop. When you're not afraid of somebody, you're, you're, you can actually, you're actually kinder to them. You know, you're not having to peacock and do all these things. And I think that when we got away from that warrior mindset and this protective mindset, the cops are now in this kind of like, I've got to peacock again because they're not confident in their training anymore. Well, when you walk up, no matter you know what you're in, whether you're in the military, whether you're in the police department, whether you're just an individual walking on the street, if somebody comes up to you and they start threatening you, if you have a, a, a let's just say, if you have a gun on your side, right, and you're just carrying, you have a, you have a, 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 a you know, you 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 have the right to carry, right. <clears throat> If you're not secure in your ability to protect yourself without that weapon, 
90% of the time, that's the first thing you go to. So uh, if you're not trained properly and if you don't have confidence in your ability to protect yourself without the weapon, um, that's what's going to happen. And I believe that, you know, leaning more towards that self-defense hand-to-hand combat gives uh, the opportunity for that not to happen as much because you feel more confident in your ability to restrain somebody or 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 people um, that you don't have to go there. And it goes the same thing when someone has got a, a partner that they're riding with or they got backup that shows up and they all know one another. And when they pull in with three people that the guy that's uh, literally engaged in this situation and he knows the three guys that are coming in to back him up have no ability to protect him hand to hand and there's three four um you know assailants you know that's a tough spot because then now you're not confident that you can sustain the situation without getting yourself into a life or death situation so i believe that a lot of this stuff that that causes instant reaction when someone pulls a weapon usually comes down to someone feeling comfortable enough to be able to, to restrain somebody. And, um, but also too, I also know there's a lot of situations where they go into it and they have no idea whether that person has that gun or not. And, and they have to, to pull right away. And what we see on a lot of these clips is we only see the first part of it or the part that they want you to see where it shows them doing the aggressive part instead of showing the whole situation where the guy literally tells him to don't get in the car. He goes in the car anyways. He comes out and he has something in his hand, but you can't tell what it is. And he's got a split second to make a decision to shoot or not shoot. I love it when you you had your conversation with Mike Tyson, which was really cool. I'd like to ask you about that too. But you mentioned that like getting in somebody's head before the fight is a big part of the fight. Uh, what people don't realize is that, before, like you said, before a fight for, that a cop is in, there's always some chatter beforehand, and it's the it's the it's what dispatch gives you. And sometimes you can be very, very intimidated before you get to the scene. You're you know the suspect six foot four, looks like he's two hundred and twenty pounds. He might have a gun. You know he looks fast. He could be. You know, and when you're driving, you're picturing you know uh you, you know you're picturing a Brock Lesnar type situation you know again shamrock situation so some cops are already in their heads before they especially a female cops i had a female partner and she used to say i hate this part i'd rather not know what i'm about to get into uh because i hate driving to the call and knowing that some dude is going to outweigh me by a hundred pounds because they're <laughs> already in my head and i think that's you know, I, 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 I literally think that a lot of people don't uh they, they never bring that up in police work and i think for training you know, when cops are in it and they're trained good and they're yelled at in the academy, when they're in your face, when they're trying to get that adrenaline up and you kind of get used to it, you can be a much, you can be a, a much better asset. And when you're confident, right, you're a little less of a bully too, right? Because when you know how to fight, you're less likely to go out and start picking fights with people. Yeah. And I think that all comes down to, to you know, the, the proper training, um, it's difficult, you know, and again, this is, these are, uh, you know, sitting here and trying to evaluate situations when, when I have absolutely no experience whatsoever in it, but you know, it is, it's a tough spot. I, 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 I've seen a lot of the situations that unfold and then, you know, only the things that they want to show you, they show you, and then you find out the whole story and, you know, and it causes these, this chatter and people fight amongst one another. And listen, it, it's a tough spot um for what these police officers do and you know um it's something that i i have always believed that you have to let somehow or another for them their industry or their organization to figure it out um and it's not an easy thing to do but i'm a big supporter of the police the the fire department the military first responders um i'm a huge supporter too. And we love you and we're excited to see you uh, in October. We got a lot of first responders coming to Jacksonville, Florida yeah. to see you. We've got one coming from Colorado uh, who's already been on the, the social media webs with us, just uh, blowing me up this character. He's really, really excited about this this fight. And so we're we're excited to, to see you. Now, listen, you know how it goes as a cop, right? People see things and they make these they think they know what that 30 second clip is. And, and you said that you don't have any experience. You do have experience when the rock smacked you in the face, everybody thought it was one way and it was absolutely a different way. Was it not right? 
Yeah, um, you know, the story doesn't always play out the way your eyes see it. <laughs> yes. It's always a story behind it. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I, you wanna, do you want to tell the people? You want to clear it up? I've, I've heard a lot of chatter about, uh, about the, the Rock giving it to you in the face. How was, uh, you know, I, 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 you've got a lot to say about it. I've heard you say it on other shows. Yeah, it was interesting because I had come from this world of, you know, badasses and, you know, I was the world's most dangerous man and captured championships in Japan and captured it here in the U.S. And it got to a point to where, you know, I needed to make a move in order to, you know, keep, you know, supporting the businesses and the family that I had built. Um, so I ended up going into uh, pro wrestling and Vince brought me in and I had this character, right? And I, I remember talking to Brett and he said, listen, don't be a pro wrestler. Be, you know, Ken Shamrock, the world's most dangerous man. Do the things that you do when you were a fighter, bring it into the pro wrestling ring. And so that's what I did. And I started bringing that stuff in there in more of an entertainment way, uh, working through holds and different things that I would do in a real shoot as opposed to in the entertainment industry. And I remember it started to really start to come together and, I remember when I was talking to Rock because there was some guys that were throwing these different punches and doing different things, and they weren't they weren't really landing like they were doing these work punches. I mean, they look good on TV, um, but to me, I felt like how can I sell something I don't feel? Like it just was odd to me. And so I remember telling guys that I was working with, say, "Hey, I'm okay if you you know you hit me a little bit because it, <laughs> I can register that. Like I know how to react to that." And I said, but when I don't feel anything, that's hard for me to work with that because it's not what I'm used to. And so guys would look at me and kind of laugh. So, okay. And so they started, you know, landing them. And I was okay with that. It was like sparring. Like it was like going in and sparring. I was, that's what I did my whole, whole career was spar. I was like, yeah, let's do it. And so I started getting some success as, as, as I started to be able to have these guys kind of give you a little more snug with me. And I remember I went in with The Rock and I, I came to him with a different idea because I watched how these guys were taking chair shots. And they were taking him to the back and they were taking him to the top of the head. And I looked at him and I was like, man, I don't want to take it like that. I like, it's like, cause I played football. Right. And I was always taught that the hardest part of your head is your forehead. You know, when you make a tackle, you stick the forehead in the chest and you drive him to the ground. And, uh, and so I'm thinking to myself, I'm not taking it that way because first of all, I don't want to, I don't want to see it coming. And, and I believe that I can, you know, take that shot. Um, the way it needs to be taken. And and I don't want to get a concussion or a, a head trauma from someone hitting me in the back or the top of the head. <clears throat> so I remember going to Rock and say, bro, here, I want you to hit me in the face. It's the easiest way I could explain <laughs> it to him, right? He looked at me and he goes, what are you, out of your mind? I said, dude, I'm telling you, I'll take care of myself. And he looked at me and he goes, no, nah, man, I can't do that. I said, well, if you don't, I'm not selling it. And he looked at me and he goes, what do you mean? I said, just when I'm there, you take that chair and you swing it right from my nose. I mean, you just bring it. And I said, if you don't swing it, I ain't selling it. And he looked at me and he goes, oh, I'll bring it. I said, you should. He remember, he, I'll bring it, but are you sure? And I said, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and he says, all right. And so I remember we get in there, we get to that spot. I'm on my knees and I'm looking up at him and I remind him. I was like, better bring it. <laughs> <laughs> so he picks up that chair and he just, man, and he just swung it. And I'm looking up at him from my knees, right? And just as the chair gets there, I just tuck my chin. So it looks like he just smashed me in the face. Yeah. But what he did was hit me in the forehead. And I remember after he hit me, the rock kind of stopped for a minute. You could see a pause. Farouk was sliding into the ring at the time and had no idea what the spot was. <laughs> stopped and looked at it and said, fuck, you just killed him. <laughs> what the hell was that? <laughs> And uh, I remember The Rock pausing for a minute, trying to stay in character. And I remember looking up at him and going, I'm good. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, like after these these matches, with especially like in wrestling, not UFC. I know that's different. But do you guys like go and like smash protein, protein shakes together? Or do you guys just go your separate ways? No, usually you, you kind of hanging out with your individual people. You know, like I hung out with Road Dog and, and, and Billy Gunn and, you know, uh, uh, the lethal weapon, um, Steve. And so yeah. there was just, like I said, everybody kind of had those guys that they kind of drove with or hung out with. And everybody was, at least to me, I think the majority of them, we were all cool, but it wasn't like you were best friends. You were doing a job together. Yeah. It's just work. It was just work. How was working with the rock? Was he, uh, was he pretty dope or 
What was that like? Rock was, Rock was one, of, like I said, there's guys that you work with that you just go, okay, I feel good being in the ring with him and I trust him. Um, and then there's other ones that you're like, uh, this is, you know, even though you can have a great match, but you know that they're kind of the wild kind and uh, you just kind of hope that they're all on their game. Yeah, well, I mean, the Rock had, he'd come from, you know, smashing people in football. So he probably knows what it's like. You know what I'm saying? So he, he, probably, again, like what we talked about with that confidence, like once you've been really, really smashed by somebody, you know, you kind of figure out how to be a little bit more friendly and violent at the same time. I used to preach that to my rookies all the time. You got to be friendly, but you also have to be violent. Friendly and uh, uh, violent. Well, what you you got you to be able to be friendly and still kick the shit out of somebody. I mean, yeah. like if they cross that line, you got to you got to you got to be able to just turn it on, let it go. Yeah, I always say you start out with an open hand of kindness, but if they fold it into an iron fist, that's on them, baby. And you yeah. got to give it to them. But look, I, I got my teeth knocked out and my arm broken by one suspect and a separate suspect. I had my leg broken from my, my uh, ankle up, a, a murder suspect that had just did 12 years in prison, got out and went to go murder the same woman that he attempted to murder that landed him the first 12 years. So I've had my ass whooped uh, more times than not. Actually, uh, I had a conversation with Chuck Liddell about that, and he was very upset that the only cop story I told him when he asked me to tell him a cop story was a story about getting me getting my ass whooped. He's like, you didn't. That's what you come out with is you getting your ass kicked. You, you don't have a better story for me. And I said, I wish I did, but that one's yeah, actually, that one's that's my probably, favorite. That's safe. <laughs> <laughs> like he's an animal. He, he's. I went to a Canelo Alvarez fight with Chuck Liddell, and we were kind of hanging out. And I said, you know, if you had to fight Logan Paul or Jake Paul right now, one of these like celebrity matches, would you do it? And he said, do I have to do the train up and the whole publicity package and the whole nine yards? And I said, I mean, you know, he's like the whole six months. And uh, I said, yeah, he's like, do I have to do the fight camp? And I said, yeah, you got to do all the things for all the, the $10 million fight or whatever it's going to be. Would you do it? And he said, no. And he's like, but you tell those motherfuckers I'll fight them right now for free. <laughs> I said, I said, Jesus, uh, that yeah, is the training is the hardest part as you get older and you kind of at that retirement part. It's not the fight because you, you just know how to do that. But it's that training and all that stuff, PR stuff, you got to do all the way up to it, man. It's just a, that's a long journey for somebody who is literally at the end of their rope. What's your, uh, you know, when, you, when you're when you watching these guys in Valor, uh, and, and these are your babies, right? Like, these are the guys that you're nurturing, uh, they're, they're big, giant babies. But, you know, you're bringing these guys up, giving them the shot of a lifetime. You're doing, do you sit back and wish you were there with them, or have you pretty much just embraced like i've embraced the role of a father i have five kids i'm not that guy anymore um and now i i'm totally comfortable passing on just all my knowledge to my kids but sometimes it creeps in sometimes i want to get the skateboard and, and kind of get on it with them is that how you feel these days or yeah you know anytime that uh you're involved and again that's why i do it because it, it takes the edge off right because it's something i enjoyed it's my dna a lot of people get to a point where they they get they're done fighting and 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 they're good right they they, they don't want to be there but for me i still love it i still enjoyed everything about it and so being a part of being able to have a business where i get to put on fights and watch other people go through those experiences i did it really makes it, it brings joy to me so um it's exciting for me i don't i'm not that person when someone goes hey you uh, you want to fight it's like i realize that it's a smarter decision now that it's not what I do. It, now I put on fights. I'm not a fighter. Yeah, we're, and, and look, again, I'm so excited to be going to, the, to this fight. Uh, October 27th uh, in Jacksonville, Florida, University of North Florida in the big coliseum there. And we'll be uh, doing a meetup beforehand with the first responders. We're super psyched about that. Uh, now, how does it feel now, right, being Ken, Ken Shamrock? I mean, you're on one of the best podcasts ever in the world you've made it you've made it on this podcast that means you've made it in life no i'm just kidding but i mean let's fat let's rewind you know to 13 years old if if you could say to 13 year old you like look man you know i feel like I've, I've listened to your stories enough i can relate to your stories in more ways than most um uh, really and i think there's a lot of cops that can relate to this a lot of cops you know it's a stereotype for a reason cops are generally c students at best barely making it through college couldn't be the athlete that they wanted to be and they become a cop so a lot of cops came from um this kind of you know they have they have backgrounds that led them to be cops and i think your background touches cops in more ways uh than most stories because at 13 man you 
you kind of knew, I feel like you kind of knew what you, you were on your own path. You had an idea. You're like, look, everybody's trying to get me to go one way. I'm going a different way. Um, you were a little bit rebellious. You had a, you took a lot of shots, psychological shots, mental shots as a child, but you came through. Did you know at 13 years old, did you have this, did you know that you were going to be where you're at right now at 13? There was this, um, defiance in me, um, because I didn't trust anybody. I went through the system with the group homes and, you know, been lied to a lot, um, you know, told to, you know, do your time and, you know, you get to go back home and in your head, you're like, go back to what? Like, that's a prize. You know, these, these, these things that I had to think about, um, that were supposed to be good were just like horrible. Like you're going to send me back into the same environment, you know? So there was, there was nothing there that really kept me wanting to look farther into the future other than sports. And I felt like once I grasped onto, you know, playing football and wrestling and, and, and people started recognizing me because of, of my athleticism. Um, that's when I realized that I, I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to be, a, I wanted to play in the NFL. I mean, literally I was a big football fan. Um, I, I, I want us, that was my desire. And, you know, obviously as we start to get older and we grow, um, you know, obstacles get in the way. I broke my neck at 17, um, took away my scholarships that, uh, in high school, uh, that I had for football and wrestling, um, told I'd never play contact sports again. Um, ended up, you know, working through all of that and getting on and playing college ball was team captain, led the team in tackles and all American, um, and made everything I could possibly do to make that comeback, but still couldn't get anybody to get past the broken neck, you know, at a university or a state college. Um, and so I kind of went on my own journey and, and went into the more like pro wrestling and started doing that and became successful, went to Japan, met with this organization, uh, called, uh, UWF, which was more of a hybrid pro wrestling, which is kind of the mixed martial arts that we see today, but it was entertainment. And then Pancras came up and that was the real legitimate first mixed martial arts shoot, like literally for real. And when I jumped into that, it became very good, very quick because I had the mentality of, you know, <laughs> you, you walk into that ring, there's no way that I'm walking out of here unless I got my hand raised to so say, you have to kill me. Uh, because I'm going to, I'm winning this thing. I ain't stopping. And, uh, so that mentality that I developed as a child growing up of, uh, you know, fighting and going through all these things and, you know, always finding ways to win and be successful, even though they weren't the best t decisions when I was younger, but it was about winning and winning at any cost. Obviously I learned as I got older, how to categorize winning and, and, and winning in the right way where you're not going to get punished for it. And that was through fighting. I could literally go in and knock the crap out of somebody, kick him in the head, knee him in the head, punch him in the face and be okay with that because I wasn't going to get in trouble now. And so that really propelled me into that mixed martial arts world. Obviously, as I got older, I started learning more values of, you know, this isn't about hurting people. This is about competing and being successful and started to change my ways a little bit as I started to mature, uh, you know, having kids and starting to understand what it was to love something. Yeah, you always so had, a lot you, of that stuff. you always had a weird thing about character. I remember listening to a story where you said that the rules were, well, they're just going to warn you if you punch them so you can punch them. You're not going to get arrested because back in the day, this was all illegal to do the closed fist strikes. But they were basically telling you, but you were running a boy's home or you were doing work with a boy's home at the time or a foster foster home. And then you were like, well, beca because I preach to these kids or not preach, but you know what I mean? Because you're a good influence that you weren't going to open hand. I mean, you weren't going to close fist strike these guys. So you've always had this weird thing about character. Where did that come from? And normally when, as a cop, when we go to these group homes, character isn't the top, it isn't on the top of the list. Where did you learn this crazy sense of character to the point where a dude's going to punch you, but you're really not going to punch him back because you want to be an example to others. Where did that come from? Yeah, that wasn't that that uh, story's crossed over because it was really about an event that I was doing in Detroit against uh, um, I believe it was Dan Severin, and I was running a group home at the time. I owned a group home, and uh, the actual they came down with the state legislation and they banned the the striking because we weren't wearing gloves, 
And so when you went in there, if you were to punch that they could come and arrest you. And I remember I was told this and I was in the main event and I wasn't going to fight because I felt like if they were taking away, you know, striking and not allowing me to do what I do, then I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to fight. Well, they had already sold tickets. It was sold out. It was a big fight. And so they came to my room and they said, Hey, we got to You got to do this, this and that. And I was like, all right. I said, but it's not going to be a big deal because I remember at the time I was hurt. I had cracked ribs. I had a, a torn meniscus and not a big deal, but it, it, it's one of those things that are painful. Uh, torn meniscus in my knee. And uh, I remember them saying, okay, well, I'll just grapple him, I guess. And, and, but I'm not going to hit him. And so I went through that whole match. It was in Detroit. It was against Dan Severn. It was our second fight. And uh, I never punched him one time because they put those rules down there, but everybody else was punching. And I thought to myself, if I get, and, and, and I developed this just because of the things that I learned growing up that, you know, you, you're a man of your word and your word is all you got that you can hold on to. That's mm -hmm. yours. And that's what that's what defines you. And so I remember saying to myself, I'm not going to go tell people like I'm going to go into this fight. They say you can't punch. And then I go in and break the rules. And then all of a sudden they come and arrest me, which I didn't know if they were or weren't um, because they just did it over in Canada at another event they had, which was just over the bridge. And so I felt like I had this group home. I had eight boys living there. I cannot risk the fact that I would destroy my reputation and they would take the home away from me and those kids would be going to another home. Mm. I couldn't risk that. So I chose not to strike and I end up losing a split decision because I didn't strike. And here, here's the funny part. He won the fight because he landed more illegal punches. I kid you not. That's the truth. <laughs> A cops can relate to that because every time a cop does something amazing, any kind of good come, uh, cop work comes with uh, paper. You can't you can't have a good case without getting in a little bit of trouble for it. Um, you know I, that that story is powerful to me, man, because it speaks a lot to your character. Matter of fact, I didn't know. I mean, of course, I knew who Ken Shamrock was. You, you know, I know you as a fighter, right? I don't know Ken Shamrock. You know, I haven't broke bread with you or anything. But when I heard that story. I think I was sold into you as a person because I said, that's a lot of character. That is a lot to put on somebody's shoulder in a sold out arena. It would be easy to quote unquote sell out in a position like that, but you held true to your guns. There's not a lot of people. There's not a lot of people these days that aren't selling out over and over again. And so when I heard that story, I was like, man, this guy, this guy's a little bit different how is it now with the group homes are you still working with with children or how does that how's that playing out yeah i still work with at-risk kids i do a lot of motivational speaking and uh, ministry work so i'm still there but um the group home i had to let go i just wasn't there enough and sure. i felt like i was doing them injustice um just having somebody else run the home and me not being involved and on the road all the time so I put my efforts in more into to doing appearances and, and meeting kids and, you know, doing motivational speaking and trying to, to reach out that way. I go to schools. In fact, this is one I'm going to be doing in a week or so, I believe. Uh, actually, when I go down to Jacksonville, I leave tomorrow and we're actually going to visit a high school. So it's very important to me um, because, you know, we look at it and you look at the way the world is today. Uh, youth don't have a whole lot to look up to. I mean, there's not a lot of this you know, real men, like men, because it seems like we're trying to take, trying to take that out. And I think that the misconception of being a man is supposed to be tough and rugged and have no feelings. And that's just not it. You could still be rough and tough and rugged and still be caring and loving. And I think that's what's being taken out of our world today. Yeah, I feel like everything's very polarized these days. It's like you 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 can't be a man unless you're a toxic man, and then you can't be a man a uh, good man unless you're uh, a soy boy. There's no, there's no in the middle. There's not you know I, I've got five kids. Love my we homeschool all five of them. I'm I'm really big in. They're all sponsored skaters. They skate competitively, skateboarders, and um, but you know I always try to teach them. Again, that whole friendly and violent thing. They're loving. They're nurturing. They're kind to everybody. Yes, sir. No, sir. They're not toxic. There's no toxic masculinity. But the, but at, in the same token, I'm not I'm not raising, um, you know, a pansy, so to speak, to be a little right. bit Someone politically comes correct. In there and, and and you know grabs your wife on the butt or the boob. Uh, um, you know that's that's you know no that that you're not getting away with that. That's not right. Happening. Yeah. 
You know, and it's funny that you bring that up, man. I, I actually, I, 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 I've said it on this show before. I've gotten to hang out with with a lot of celebrities. I worked on a major network before this, and I got to travel around. and I, And I was so disappointed on how some of these guys act on the road. Um, and I, and I, when I was with them, when I was on the road for about a year, I told myself, man, I'm never going to be that guy. I'm, I'm not going to be that guy. But I don't understand why people get away with it. Why it's when it's the most popular, the guy that does the most drugs that has the most money and is the loudest one in the room is allowed to, to stare at a woman's breast, to call her baby girl, to grab her by the hips. And people will just take selfies while he's doing that. And it's, right. I mean, if he was any other guy, you would be like, you've had too much to drink. I'm about to go call your wife, my damn self, go sit mm-hmm. in the car the rest of the night and take a break. But because they've got some kind of fame, <laughs> you know, and they got some kind of in- Instagram following or whatever it is, everybody at the table just kind of allows that behavior to happen. And I came back from one of the trips. I said it on the show. I said, look, I allowed it to happen. I sat there and I saw a guy who I admire, who's been on TV many, many times, who's always talking about family values and everything. I saw him act like a complete crud bag. And I didn't say anything about it. Sometimes I laughed, you know, yeah. and I said, you know, going forward. And I, I, I think having a guy like you go into a high school thing, going to these high schools and teaching these kids, nobody is telling these kids that it's okay to have values. It's okay to have right. character. It's totally fine to have yep. some discipline. It's okay to be proud to be a man. It's okay. It's okay to be proud to be a woman or, or, or a girl or a boy. Be proud. You don't fold in because someone is trying to tell you to be something you're not. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, that's powerful stuff, man. I, 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 you know, those kids are so lucky they have no idea. You know, there was nobody that came to my high school and, and spoke when I was in high school. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it really goes a long way. Was there any police officers, correction officers that stood out into in in your mind when you were going? Through all this, and like just to recap really quick, you went through some crazy stuff in and out of group homes, running away, you got stabbed, you got shanked. Your story is incredible. And if you're a cop in your cop car right now, first responder in your meat wagon or whatever it is, I encourage you to spend the rest of your day going through some of these longer interviews with Mr. Shamrock. His story, I'd love to, I'd love to read the book. Is there a book coming yeah. out? Yeah, it's a, it, there's a one that just came out not too long ago. So um, there it is. I have three books out, um, Beyond the Lion's Den, In the Lion's Den, and then Shamrock. So it, oh, the, there are a lot of good stories. Um, and the stories that are, are true and real, they're not fabricated uh, to, to sell books or to get clicks or do any of that stuff. It's just real, true stories. Mm. Uh, was, was there any first responders that, that, that you remember growing up that, that negatively affected you or positively affected you? Well, obviously, my dad, who owned the group home, he wasn't a, a, a first responder. He just kind of ran homes and, and helped lots of kids. And my mom also, uh, Dee Dee, um, just, just great people. They, they, they gave a lot of kids a lot of opportunity, and they taught those values. You know, um, my, my father, and I know this is probably not going to go over well with a lot of people, he, knocked the, he beat the crap out of me because I beat the crap out of another kid for not vacuuming the room right. And so when he told me, uh, one time to to do something and I didn't do it right. He beat the crap out of me, showed me in the closet, out of a closet. I mean, he wouldn't punch me or like that, but just kind of like grabbed me by the nap of the neck and the pants and slammed me in one closet, slammed me. Now I was probably 14 at the time, <clears throat> the back of the door and he dropped me down. He looked at me and he said, you didn't do it right. And I was like, mm. then I remember thinking it all came to me like, well, I did the same thing. And how did that make me feel when he didn't come and say, no, just you didn't. And then he explained it to me. He's like, you got to be able to talk because I didn't understand, right? I mean, I'm a young kid coming from the streets that that's how you fix things, right, is violence. And so the only way I would ever understand this was if it happened to me. And so I remember as soon as it did, I remember going down and hugging him, like saying, um, I, you're right, man. I, I, I get it because I, would, I, I wouldn't have understood anything else. Uh, because everything else to me was soft. Talking was a bunch of lies. Everybody tells you what they want you to hear. And so I wouldn't have understood it or had the ability to be able to go into a position now where talking does happen. It does make sense. But I would have never got there if I didn't understand all the other things that I was doing through violence. And so I remember that was a big, big learning point for me. And I would say probably the there was a cop named Wayne Sullivan who was in Susanville, California, that 
was a, a, a really good friend in times. And, and I remember riding in the car with him a couple of times and uh, he would talk to me and, and we'd lift weights. I, that's how we got to know one of those. I was pretty strong. I was, uh, I think in high school, I weighed 160 pounds and I benched 320. So I was really a strong kid. And uh, he was also in the gym and he kind of, kind of, even though I was in the group home, he took me under his wing and kind of walked me through a bunch of stuff and got to know him. And, you know, that, that just didn't happen. Most of the time you see a police officer, you ran. And so that's what I thought was they were always after me. And so that really helped me kind of not hate, like, because I got to actually know somebody wearing that, the badge and that they were really no different than anyone else. They were just doing a job. And so it helped me understand that by by knowing them. And that's why I think it's important with the, the FOP and them working with the youth is because all these kids that come from these streets are being told something about police officers and that how bad they are. But then when you actually start working with them through sports and these other programs and you're starting to meet these guys, now you start realizing they're no different than your mom and dad. Like they're human beings. And to us kids that were coming from that street, there was no connection there. It was the enemy. And so I think a lot of these things and working now, us partnering with the FOP uh, is very big for me because I know for myself, being able to have that friendship and that understanding of, of who police officers are behind the badge really helped me not hate and, and constantly always fear them because I knew that that was, a, that was a lie that people were feeding you because they didn't want you to go to, to, to didn't want you to be good or do things right. They wanted you to, to, to spin drugs, to fight, to do all these things for them and blame the police for it. Uh, you, you're going back to your, your foster, your, fo- your your mom and your dad, the ones that you call your mom and your dad, they, they really loved you. Yes. They yeah, really no doubt, man. loved you. Um, and I think that's what makes you different. Uh, is that you experience when I hear that story that you just told just now about the right. closet thing? I mean, dude, that's hardcore love right there. That that's <laughs> life lessons, and that's a lot. That's not, you know, that's not something to take lightly. I mean, that that guy wanted to to mold you and to create something great out of you. Well, he he um, because he had worked in group homes for a while. He he kind of understood that. Do everybody's is is doing nothing. They're not really affecting the, 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 the problem. They're not trying to fix the problem. They're just trying to sugarcoat it. And he knew that the kind of person I was was fight first. Um, and and it if I didn't experience that, I wouldn't have understood what it felt like or, or how wrong it was. I, I wouldn't have seen it. You could have talked to me a million times. I would not have seen it. That incident right there, because of the kind of kid I was, I was a physical and I was fighting all the time. The only thing I understood was fighting. And if he hadn't have done that, I don't think I ever would have got it. I wouldn't have understood what I had been doing to other people. Yeah, and it, 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 and it was a very complex way of parenting, you know, because not only did he put you through that experience, but then he talked to you man to man. And got on your level to a point that you you understood it. And being a father of five, you know, I'm always I'm always interested in everybody's parenting techniques because I want to be the best father in the world. Like I want to die with all five of my kids, not any of them going wayward or that they're that, you know, I would like to see on my dying bed that all five of my kids, some way or another, are amazing human beings. And I know in order to do that, then I have to be a really good father. So I put all of my eggs, all of my eggs. And to making sure that I'm a great father first and then I'm a good podcaster. I'm a good distillery owner. You know, I, I want to be good at those things, but I want to be great at being a father. And so the hearing the story from you and seeing how that that impacted your life, it's not, you know, sometimes you got to put your hands on, on a kid. That's the only way they're going to learn. Some kids, my middle child, if I put my hands on him, I don't know if he'll ever talk to me again. <laughs> you know? right. He's not that kind of kid. If I look at him, if I look at him and I say, hey, homie, right. you know, he's like, uh, okay, dad, I got to put my 10 year old. You know, boy, I got, you know, I, I've had to, I've had to spank him probably like yeah. three times, I, but he gets it. And, 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 you know, so every, every child's different, uh, but wow. Uh, hats off, uh, hats off to your father. Are you allowed to say his name? Yeah. He passed away a few years right. back. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
well, man, what a what an what an incredible guy, man, because he's he's molded. He's molded a fine human being, man. You know, from from everything that I've heard about you, uh, sitting here with you, you know, he's done, he did a good job. He did a good yeah, job. Yeah, it's it, it's it, and again, it, everybody has situations that are different, and this is where I I hate when people try to tell you how to raise a child, and they give you these these seven steps to do, and it's like you. It's that's not how it works. There's no book that says on every single child that this is how you do it. Every kid is different. And the only way you know that is by being that parent. And so when people on the outside look at a parent doing something and I get it, some some are are, are wrong. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying. But in some cases, that parents are raising their kids and you see something happen. But you just like a lot of things that we talk about, but you don't know the whole story. Uh, on what's going on. And if somebody would have saw him do that to me, they would have pulled me out of the home and, and, and put me in another one. And I'd have never been where I'm at. Um, and that would have been sad because all he was doing was evaluating my situation, understood who I was as a kid, what I had already gone through. He had all the information he needed on me and how I responded to things. And in order for anybody to be able to change me, they had to have an understanding of me, me personally, and who I was in order to affect me. And he did that. And then if anybody else would have saw that, they would have like completely took his license and all this and would have destroyed something that had been working for so long. And he didn't do that with everybody. Like you said, every kid is different. Some kids you touch, you could ruin them, right? But the only ones that know that are the ones that love that kid and understand that kid and are able to understand what is going to work with them. And that's where, that's, you said it right there. It's, it's, this, it's, it's you have to love a kid. That's why I said... That guy loved you because it takes love to understand. Like it, it, it's easy to be selfish. You be caught up in your own emotions, in your own anger. But when you love your child, when you love somebody like that, you make you make conscious efforts not to do things based on your own emotions, your own feelings. You get on their level and you figure it out. Same with a wife. Domestic Violence Awareness Month this month, guys. I'm a huge advocate of loving your wife um, and treating her like a saint and always being uh, kindly in front of her. I always say, listen, I will never say a negative thing about my wife. I will never call her uh, the B word. I'll never call her any names. And I hate when people do that around me to their significant others. It's so damaging. If you love somebody, uh, you love them all the time and, and you have to practice that and, and, and it has to be instilled in you. Um, well, there's something I believe on that note too is that when you get into a marriage with somebody, um, the one thing that I see happen a lot, and it's innocent, it's not something that someone does on purpose, but then as you do it more and more over a 10 year period or a 20 year period, it becomes, it starts to become a problem. And it's, that's when you, whenever you're with a group of friends and that you guys have this, this thing where you joke with, with someone was saying that, you know, there's something they do that they don't do well, but it's kind of a joke, right? Like, oh, you know, you, you never really do this. And, you, you know, you can't, you, you're bad at, at paying bills. You know, it's kind of a joke thing, right? And like, I'd never give them this or never give them that. Um, and it's a joke, but you do that for 10 years and you never in my, at least in my experience, you and your wife are a team, your kids and everyone. And that whenever you have around a group of people, you should never be involved in a group that is going to make a fun of you, even though it's innocent type stuff, it becomes very old, very quick when it happens all the time. You should always be unified and together when you're in a group of people. Oh my gosh. I, I, I love that more than I preach that all the time. Building you, building each other up in a relationship and a marriage goes so far. Yep. And it was one thing that my wife told me when I first met her is she says, I will promise you this. I will never, ever tear you down. Um, and, and even if of other it's people. an innocent joke, it's still, it, it, over exactly. time it becomes an issue. Exactly. And I was in my twenties and I had met her and she'd had some, you know, we were in our younger twenties, but she'd had some relationships. I had had some relationships. And so we were kind of trying to figure out if we were going to actually like be like in a relationship relationship. And, and she was saying, I was like, so what are some like deal breakers for you? And she said, listen, don't, I, I said, if you never call me a bitch or anything like that, or never tell me to shut up or never 
you know, be hateful to me. I will never tear you down. And I was like, because when I was younger, like I thought that was what was cool. You know, I thought that was flirty, you know, to right. be like, you know, and you think, cause you see everybody doing it. You see everybody doing it. You, you go to, you know, your parents' cocktail dinners and you see that, you know, you saw your parents' friends doing that stuff. And, but when she said that to me, I was like, deal, deal. I will never call you a bitch. I'll never tell you to shut up. I'll never say anything nasty like that. If you'll never tear me down in front of a bunch of people. Should always build weird each random, other up all the time. Like, you're right, should dude. should always be positive. Always. Positive. Always. And people, and I can't say that enough. I, it's after 13 years of, of being married to my wife with now with five kids, I, I love my wife more and more every single day. And I can't think of a single time that, like you said, Jeremy, tear, tear, tore me down. I think that is brilliant. I, 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 it can't be said enough. Don't tear down your partners if you love them. And don't tear down your kids equally. Like, you know, exactly. don't be like, man, I wish my kid would mow the yard better in front of a bunch or of like, people. Yeah, because Don't be stupid. Come on, you're yeah. smarter than that. You know, yeah. innocent stuff that that's, you keep saying it and pretty soon, I mean, that just sticks in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you're absolutely right. Look, I got one more big question I want to bring in Deadlock because he's a huge fan of yours. He's our producer and every once in a while I like to throw the producers a bone. Um, but sitting across, listen, you sat, you've sat across from some angry, just violent, vicious dudes, unscathed, unfazed by it, unintimidated. I have to ask though, how was it sitting across from Mike Tyson? Yeah, you got to understand me <laughs> and, uh, I have never feared anyone. Um, the only thing I fear is God. I don't fear him, but I fear for my salvation. Like I, that's, I'm constantly trying to make sure that I'm going in the right direction. But other than that, man, there's nobody. And I mean, nobody, um, that I've ever sat with or around that I was in awe of. Uh, I just, I just appreciate people. I think everybody has their value and I believe that we're very fortunate, Mike Tyson, myself and other athletes that. People love us and they don't even know us. Like they literally see us do something and then they just like they're big fans. And that's special, you know, and that's that's a lot to live up to. And I think that uh, we have a big responsibility for that. So but as far as that part, I've never I've never had that. I've never really sat in front of somebody and just kind of went, whoa, you know, it just to me, I just look at them as they're special people. They've done something. They're good at something. Um, you know, I can I remember I. Uh, you know, my father, Bob, who did what he did for all those kids. And then there's other people that I have met uh, in that um, industry that I look at and just go, man, they're special. Um, they're just really special people, uh, more so than what I would see uh, in, 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 in the president or, or politicians or, or anything. Uh, I look at military, I look at police officers, I look at, you know, people that work with kids, uh, group home. I, they're just to me it's it's a, a different thought process it's special i think them as being special um but as far as at we're just doing what we love to do man i mean and we happen to be good at it like there's there's no there's no i don't see like how that's like you know, like when people are trying to help other people, I don't see the value as us athletes doing what we do. We get to do something we love and get paid money for it. I mean, like, why are we so popular? I love it. Don't get me wrong. But it just doesn't. It's just it, the, the balance of it doesn't make sense on what our value is as opposed to, a, you know, a, a social worker or a teacher or, you know, somebody who's working out with kids, police officers, military people that are out there doing stuff that literally are risky. Man, I you can't you can't answer a question badly. Like every answer that you give just makes me like you more and more and more. My <laughs> wife's gonna be really upset. I'm gonna have like a big Kim Shamrock poster in my room now, and uh, I'm gonna be walking around in my underwear with knee pads on, like, body <laughs> slamming my kids. <laughs> she's gonna be like, she's gonna be like, man, that's enough Kim Shamrock for you. I'll be body slamming my kids. You know, uh, huge fan here. Speaking of huge fans. Um, Mr. Shamrock, if we could, can I bring on my producer? He's been just a longtime fan. I know he's got this awesome mustache that, you know, <laughs> you want a body slam. When you, when you see a guy like that with a mustache like that, you're like, man, I wish I had a steel chair to put right right there in the middle of his face. Just to No. Wipe. I mean, can I say this on your station? It looks say like whatever a you want. porn star. Yeah, say whatever you want. These are all cops. They're all dirtbags anyway in real life. No. <laughs> Deadleg was a police officer yeah, I, in – 
He was a Hawaii. He was a Hawaii police officer, so he's got oh, that whole Hawaii Five O thing going on. The Hawaii Five. Go ahead, Josh. Don't be shy. <laughs> so you, you've had a, an amazing career between the UFC and then professional wrestling side of things. The only question I have is: there anybody that you didn't get to fight or didn't get to work with in the in your career that you wanted the opportunity or wish that you maybe had the opportunity to work with? Yeah, I think in pro wrestling it would be uh, uh, Bill Goldberg, and then. Um, um, Kurt Angle and Brock Lesnar, those three, I thought, man, that would have been fun. Um, that didn't happen. Um, I think in, in UFC, I've always said this, and it's not who I didn't get a fight, but it's when I fought him. Uh, it would have been Tito if I was 10 years younger. I just, it was such a, I mean, I felt bad that I didn't, wasn't able to give him my best because he deserved it. He was a great champion. He was a great fighter. Um, I thought was at one time pound for pound the best. Um, and I just felt really bad that I didn't really get to give him the 100% of Ken Shamrock. Mm. And then I guess I got one, one more other question and then I won't keep you too, too long. Uh, given the careers that you've had and then a lot of others, do you, do you, do you find something that there's a, a similar background with with people that have gone through Japan early in their career, be it professional wrestling or even with the fighting side of things. A lot of people that have gone that route, they've seemed to have had sustained the course and been able to stay over time. Is there anything to that or is it just by coincidence? No, I think it's just a discipline that they're, they learn from, I think, in, in Japan and some of the work habits that they do, uh, the training they do. I, I think it really does help you sustain your career longer because you're willing to work. A lot of people get in this and they have shortcuts um, and they're able, because of their athletic ability, they're able to rise to the top pretty fast because they're just athletically good. And the sport hadn't developed enough yet for people to have to be that technically sound as, a, as it is right now. There's just, now you've got to really be technically sound. Whereas we did it, you, you know, you could be a great athlete and get through it. Right. And so I think that when you go to Japan, they teach you those technical things. They teach you how to be a fighter. And so I think when guys transfer here to the U.S., they're way ahead of people that start into this backyard gym or some other gym that's putting them into a fight right away because they're just tough guys. Um, and they don't last long because they take a lot of punishment because they are tough. So I think <clears> – <throat> That you the, the the discipline that's instilled in you when you actually start over in Japan gives you an opportunity to sustain longer. Uh, we got to do some ads for today's show. Today's show is brought to you by GhostBed.com. And, of course, we've got Factor Meals and Officer Privacy with the election seasons ramping up. That means the easy hate for police is just going to get stronger and stronger, which means you need to protect yourself. OfficerPrivacy.com forward slash Wolfpack. Don't wait until you've shot somebody or you've beat somebody into submission and it goes ultra viral to have officer privacy. That's too late. They've already got your address. They already know what gym you go to. They already know what church you go to. I've said it a million times. One of my best friends on the planet got an officer involved shooting. They were protesters at his church, at his jujitsu gym, at his CrossFit gym. They were at his house. They didn't have officer privacy back then. Officerprivacy.com is going to right now get rid of your address and all the pertinent things that go with your address, the gyms, the the uh, uh, restaurants that you attend, all the things that you want off of the internet that you want people to know about, they're going to help you get rid of those. And these are uh, detectives, former cyber detectives that invented this. They're also coming out with, we're, or are trying to encourage them to help come out with an influencerprivacy.com. Again, it's not getting rid of you. It's not getting rid of your social media and your influence. It's getting rid of your address, your gym, where you go to church, where your family goes to preschool and schools. If you know an officer, yeah. because cops are hard-headed and they're not going to buy this stuff on their own, they're not going to do it because they want to spend their money on everything else. If you have a loved one that's a law enforcement officer, get them a subscription to officer privacy. Get them started wiping that stuff off the map. Every couple of months they revisit it and make sure that you stay off of the map so that you don't get Molotov cocktailed or protested or embarrassed uh, at your, your gym or your, your kids' preschool, Lord forbid. We also have ghostbed.com, the way I sleep at night uh, and the way I stay looking so youthful at the, the young age of 40 here is because I get a good night's rest. 
mental wellness starts with a good night's sleep. And that's why we're proud to partner with GhostBed at GhostBed.com. Matter of fact, we went down the GhostBed facility last month and I got to sleep on Serena Williams' bed that she invented. Not the bed in her house, but a bed that she came up with with all the healing things in it. Fabulous bed. Uh, but it is actually sleep so good that it's scary. And their bed's made in the good old USA. And they're the uh, longest owned brand bed company in the United States, which is pretty awesome. And they're massive supporters of first responders and the military veterans. They've been with me since day one. We're almost going on four years now that I've been promoting ghost bed. I couldn't be more happy. And then we have factor meals, meal planning to the next level. Spending time with your children is important. Meal planning takes a lot of time. You got to go to the grocery store. You got to buy the shrimp. You got to buy the chicken. You got to buy the bacon. You got to buy the cream sauce. Do all things. You got to come home. You got to cook it then you got to prepare it. you got to divvy it out in all of its dishes that's valuable time and money that you could have been spending with your family uh and and i, I preach it all the time on here you want to be a great cop but a lot of great cops have really shitty families and that's because they're so concerned with their calorie conscious meals those wash what that's fine that's fine but let's find some time in the day Let's, let's squeeze in some time for family and factor meals is one of the great ways to do that. These are meals delivered straight to your door from a chef and a little freeze dried things with the cost of gas and everything else. It's very, com uh, it's very competitive with the grocery store, but they're, they're fresh, never frozen. And they get delivered right to your house. You put them in the refrigerator. You take them to work. Two minutes in that little first responder uh, microwave. Everybody's got those Pyrex dishes. They're spending five minutes hogging up the the, the room there, hogging up the microwave, pissing everybody off. Two minutes, you're in and you're out, and you have a beautiful meal look. Meal planning, calorie conscious, vegan, protein heavy, whatever you need, Factor Meals can get you with over 300 menu options. Go to Factor Meals, use that promo code WOLFPACK50. Uh, real quick, before we let you go, Mr. Shamrock, we've got you October 27th at the Valor Fights. Uh, this is this promotion is is big. This is a big fight. Are you, are you excited? Are you feeling good? Uh, about uh, the bare knuckle fight part due in Jacksonville? Yes, we're, we've are we been working on this for a while. Obviously, you know, 2019 we opened, uh, but, you know, COVID kind of hit and I wasn't a big fan of doing doing fights without a, a fan base. So we worked a lot of stuff on our apps and different things to build a business structure. And now here we are getting ready to do our second one. And we're very excited. October 27th at the University of North Florida in Jacksonville, we're very hyped about this fight. We have a lot of great fights on here. It's true bare knuckle. This is the thing we're trying to get people to understand. All these other ones, and they're good. Don't get me wrong. I've watched them too. But it's not true bare knuckle. They taped their hands or this and that. This is no clinching, which allows fighters to have to fight. You don't get to hold them and do all these punches. It's straight boxing without gloves. No tape. True. No cages, no ropes to lay on, man. This is true action. So if you want to come down and check it out, man, you're going to see some great fights. I'm already I'm already doing it. Kumte, kumte, kumte. Uh, real quick, uh, that was a reference to Bloodsport, one of the greatest fight movies of all time. We can argue, we can debate about it, but I, I'm not going to be convinced otherwise because um, I've seen all the fight movies, and, and Bloodsport's my favorite. Frank Dukes, my, my kid Duke. Uh, now, the, the rink, really quick. Tell, can you tell me about the ring and how you've set that up? That's different. That's new. I, I just read about it. That's different. What, what's the yeah, deal with that? I, I originally came up with that idea because I, I felt like some of the things I had learned uh, as a fighter and hearing the, the fan base and the media was that visual was always a problem when you buy those seats on the floor. Like it was always like your third, second row, fourth row. It was like you were always trying to look around something, not people in front of you because it's up a little bit, but felt like the ropes or the cages were kind of like always blurring the vision of watching these fights. And I thought to myself, man, if we take them down, how would that affect the fight? And I remember thinking to myself, as a fighter, being in there fighting, I never had to have ropes or cages to keep me in the fight. And so I thought, well, let's just take them down because, like, if you're there and you're backing up, then you're you don't belong there. And so we did that. And um, fortunately for us, man, it was a visual explosion. It really was something special. Uh, it made it much, much more uh, for guys, people that were actually on the floor to be able to see a great fight. And so that's kind of where that came from. Was it because we were trying to make the fights faster, which is what happened because you can't back up? and lay on the ropes or the cage to kind of rest for a minute or rope and dope. 
You can't do that. So now you have to be on your feet more and you have to fight more. Uh, there's nowhere to go, right? And when you take out the clinching, you're like, now it's even faster. So it really developed into something that has been pretty spectacular. Um, again, like I said, when you watch these fights, you'll, you, you're going to see exactly what I'm talking about. These fights are fast. Yeah, fast and violent. I like it. Um, I thought you took out the ropes because of what happened in WCW uh, with The Rock. I think you would have had him pinned, but at the last second, he reached out and grabbed the rope. Kind of ruined it for you. End up getting disqualified with the uh, with the steel chair. And I thought you were like, that's never going to happen to me again. I'm, yeah, I'm going to invent my own fighting. It. No ropes. <laughs> no ropes. I'm just kidding. Hey, listen, we're so excited to see you um, in October, man. Thank you for everything that you've done as a human being. Um, you've inspired us, and I hope that the law enforcement officers and the veterans that are listening to this are inspired as well. Go check out his books. Go check out his fighting. Go to the website, Valor Bare Knuckle Fights, and uh, get your tickets and come uh, come hang out with us. Listen, uh, for the Wolfpack, we got a little meetup going on uh, on that Thursday night before the fight. We will we'll be having a meetup, so if you're if you're traveling in, it's going to be at Island Girl Cigar Bar for us for the for the meetup. Don't know who's going to be there. Uh, we we might be blessed with some with some cool folks. I know Anthony Ramonde is coming up uh, from Orlando. So if you're a big Anthony fan, he'll be there. Um, uh, First Responder Cigar Company, Delta Force Operator Brent will be there. Uh, so we're going to have a really good meetup at Island Girl Cigar Bar on that Thursday. Get up with us. DM us if you have questions. If you want to know where we're staying, DM us. I'm not going to put that out on the social webs. But if you want to stay in the same hotel as all the other Wolfpackers, uh, let us know and we'll let you know where we're staying. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shamrock, for everything that you've done. And we're excited to see you in uh, the end of the I appreciate you guys. Thank you. All right, man. See you guys.